Reverend Howell, I appreciate it if you'd tell me your name. Montreal Howell. No, no middle initial? No middle initial, just one name. How old are you, Mr. Howell? 66. When were you born? October 23rd, 1919. Would you be kind enough to tell me your mother's name and your father's name? Uh, my mother's name was Lula Howell, Carlton Howell, and my father's name was Randall Howell. How old was your father when he died? Father was around 62 when he passed. How old was your mother? Mother was 60, 60 father was 61, she's 62. When, when was your father born, do you remember? No, I don't remember the date of my father's birth. Do you remember your mother's birthday? No, I can't say that. That's all right, no problem. Did you have any brothers and sisters? Yes, I did. At and 17, four brothers and sisters. 17, 17 brothers and sisters? 17 brothers and sisters, right. 18 in family. How many brothers did you have out of that? Um, well, I don't know. Some of them died young. I'm not oh, able to tell the exact amount oh, yeah. of brothers. Oh. But I have, uh, as of now, I have uh, two brothers that's living mm -hmm. today and four sisters. Now, where were you born? I was born in Wilkes County in the place called Boomer. That's where I was born, Boomer. That's back up off of 18. Right, off of 18 between Wilkesburg and Lenore. Right. Well, now, was a doctor in attendance when you were born, or was there a midwife? No, I think not. All midwives. Well, I mean, you wouldn't know, but your mother well, might tell you. That's right, because that was going on when I was old enough to remember midwives, so I'm sure they was not a, a regular doctor back yeah. before that time. Midwives were going on then. Would you be kind enough to give me some background history on your people as far back as you'd like to take me? Oh, yes, the, the, the Howell family is one family in particular that has had the privilege of going back even to slavery days. And uh, there have been many families that, that does not able, not able to trace their descendants back that far. Uh -huh. But the Howell family has been able to go back. You know, there's, there's a legend that goes on. We've got a lot of oral history in our lives back there, and so we have to take what the older people told us. It was told to us that a slave left uh, the Bahamas, and her name was Hannah. And the date that, uh, that she come over was not known, the exact date she was brought to America, but the legend goes that she was wife of a chieftain, so, uh, yeah, a chieftain somewhere in the Bahamas. We don't know the exact place where she come from, but her whole family was captured by the English to be brought to America as slaves. Then while en route to America, uh, as they made their journey, then her husband, I don't know whether he thought it wasn't worth the journey or what, but he jumped overboard and he's never been heard tell of anymore since that time. But Hannah came on to America and brought with her four sons and one daughter. They were sold on the slave block in Statesville, North Carolina, and Hannah and her daughter, Teen, were sold to a slave owner called Sherd Howe and transported to Wilkes County somewhere, somewhere in the Boomer community. I, I guess I've been lucky to hold on to my heritage to stay from, uh, from where my parents, uh, grandparents settled at. I'm still there today. There's no record of her four sons as to what happened to them, who, were, who they were sold to, or what became of them. Then while a slave on the Sherrod Howe plantation, Hannah gave birth to five sons. They were, oh, uh, like to know them? Yes, sir. Yes, well, sir. Uh, her sons were Jake Howe. She, he was married to Susan Hayes. And Randall Howe married to Jane Horton. Thomas Kling Howe, he was married to Lucy Elizabeth Howe on October the 4th, 1875. That was before my day, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Long time before you. Then going back to, uh, he had another son named Charlie Howell. He was never married. Then Frank Howell married Polly Hayes. And so Frank Howell happens to be my grandfather. So that brings me in focus with, with our family as from slavery days up to where my grandfather come into the picture. And my grandfather, Paul, uh, his family, well, yes, Hannah, you know, she, he, her sons were Jake, Randall Thomas, and Charlie, and Frank. Mm -hmm. 
and she just had one daughter, Irene, and then Irene was married to Jim Parsons. Then in the Boomer community, we have a, a host of Parsons is there. So we we're able then to link our family ties back together, the Parsonses and the, uh, and the Howells. Because we all came distinctly from the same family, but saw the Howells, uh, they came out of the, uh, the sons, and then the Parsonses just had one daughter. Right. And the Parsonses started with Irene. She married Jim Parsons. Then going back to, to Jake, Hannah's first son, he was married to Susan Hayes, and their sons were Gus, Chauncey, Gruff, and Charlie. Had three daughters, Amelia, Dice, and Irene. So it's a long story, but uh, when you come back to Dice, that's my wife's stepmother. And that ties in with, uh, with the family on that side. And uh, then they would go back to, to Randall's. He's married to Jane Hart, and they didn't have any children. But he was one of the sons that come over with the slave mother. Then Thomas was married to Isabel Barnes, and their sons were Christy, Walter, Johnny, Millard, and Zeno, who were all um, members of the Boomer community. And uh, they all raised families in the Boomer community, and that made the large family. That constituted part of the school, part of the church. Daughters was Amelia, Roxy, and Myrtle. And all this uh, helped to make the community what it was with the number of people. Then Frank Howell, my grandfather, was married to Polly Hayes, and their son was Randall. Daughters, Vash, Tymeri, and Cor. So it seems that in that, they were just my father was on this boy in the family. And he was married then to Lula Carlton, and Lula Carlton also was, I mean, she being my mother, she also, her father was a slave. He was freed under that. His name was Alexander Carlton. And he was freed under the, uh, in the emancipation of slave. And then to Lula, well, my father was married twice. He's married before he married my mother. And to that union were born four children. And then my mother uh, was mother of 18. So my father was a father of 22 children. And when you think about that, that's quite a large family. Then I being the last son in the family before, you know, my father, me being the last boy, I, I guess I had a closer relationship no doubt with my father than my other sons did. They, uh, you mean your other brothers? My other brothers, yeah. pardon me. Yeah. That's my other brothers. Father. They had a, they had a, uh, more or less a, a working relationship yeah. with my father. He was a, uh, my father was sharecropper. Uh -huh. And he would work sharecrop in the summertime. And then in the winter, he would go to West Virginia and work in the coal mines. He was a, well, I didn't know that much about it, but he was considered an outstanding coke puller. He pulled coke. And I've heard my father, I, I had the privilege of going to the coal mines as a boy and seeing where my father worked. Mm -hmm. And he worked in what they call the coke ovens, and he would pull from seven to nine ovens a night. Mm -hmm. And he showed me uh, principally how that this coke oven would work. Uh -huh. They had a, they would take the slag or the or the what I what I would call it, I would say the coal dust. Actually, run through a temple and washed out the coal dust. They would take that and haul it and put it in these coke ovens. Build a fire to it. it would burn a certain length of time until it got charred into a solid coal. They would water it down and they had a long bar. Looked like it's about from 12 to 18 feet long, called a breaker. And they take this and break this coat down. And when they broke it down, then they water it down. And they had a puller. It was made like a, well, I would explain it like a big hole mm -hmm. on the end of a long bar. And this bar was crooked. They put it around your waist and back up to pull this coke out. It was a hot. You couldn't get close to it. But this bar in pulling these nine oats, it would come to be so hot. 
until he'd wear uh, wool gloves on the inside, leather gloves on the outside. It would burn those gloves. And my father's hands was burned to the extent with this labor that, that I've seen him like we had a fireplace at home, and fire would roll down on the hearth. I see him just take his hands and pick this up. You could smell his hands, mm. but it would not, it not affect him. He, his hands was burning that day. He'd sit down and take a razor and just cut chunks out of his hands, just Cow well, with, with no disgrace to my father, but it no. was more like a trimming a horse's hoof or something like that, just cut flesh chunks so it looked like it should be hard flesh out of his hands. This is the type of life that, that my father went through with that. You explain it this damn time, not many people would even understand, would you? Oh, uh -uh, no. It no. took all that to, to make me what I am. Yeah. Well, now, I want to ask you, how did he get to West Virginia? He walked. Principally, most of the time, he walked. This is what I'm finding people keep telling me. Right. They walked. They didn't have the money to ride the train. That mm -hmm. would have been all of it. No. And there were no cars back then, were no, principally the time you walk. Did Sometimes he you tell money to go well, on the train. Well, when you went up there, how did you go? Did you ride a train with him, or did you walk with him? No, I went. When I went, I, I rode on the back of a truck, a lumber truck, yeah. and okay. we rode up there. We just we just rode up there on the back of the truck. Did you go with a bunch of men that were going up to work, or did no, you uh, walk to well, sightsee? Well, principally, uh, my father. The biggest experience I had in the in the going to the coal mine to really understand it, you know, was after yeah. he had passed. Oh yeah, okay. Going okay. there when oh, my yeah. aunt and uncle were there, and they showed me all about how he worked. And I remember I was only nine years old when my father died. I remember very much to explain about his part of it. But this is most of what I understand about the coal was going there, seeing where he worked uh -huh. after he died, and then it would come back to my memory how he explained to me how he done this work. I had the privilege of going seeing what he, what he was talking about. When he was talking about breaking down the coke and all this, it, it seemed like, a, well, it was, it was like an imagination that yeah. had not become to be a reality. But when I went and seen it firsthand, it became to be a reality to me, what he was telling me. Well, that's right. As he got on up in his years, he had more time to spend with you as a young boy than he would have with his sons that had been a lot older when they were having to work. Now. It's true, that's and right. that's where you, you actually reap more benefit from your father's knowledge than probably your other brothers or any of them. Weren't. Well, I would think so. Now, uh, my father was, I'm like him, I say it that way. Yeah. He liked to hunt. Uh -huh. And I was only nine years old when he died, but two years before he died, uh, he didn't go to coal mine. and. Uh, He'd done very little farming, and he and I would hunt. I had the privileges of hunting, going hunting with my father, and carrying the game. And I, uh, but you know, a nine-year-old boy, he don't know how to, to be swelled up in his daddy. But yeah. I found calls too one day. So. <laughs> <laughs> the reason it was there were three little young squirrels playing in the tree, and I thought daddy could do anything. But I wanted to catch the squirrels, and I found out he couldn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I kind of got puffed up with daddy that day because he, he killed the squirrels instead of catching them. So, but I soon got over it after I found out that he was just a man and not a squirrel, so he couldn't catch them. Well, with your father dying when you were real young, I have an idea you had to work hard for your mother to help her make it, didn't you? That's right. It throwed a, a hardship on the family. Um, my older brother, he was five years older than I was. And uh, me being nine years old, that told him to be about 13, somewhere yeah. along there when my father died. So he was working and he was able to hold a, a pretty good job to work on up, say, four or five years after my father died. He was, you know, working regularly, he would work. But it got to the place after my father died that uh, the family had to share in order to uh, to make ends meet, let's say it like that. And I was, uh, my father died when I was nine. When I was about 11 years old, uh, I began to, to work out to make something to help out with the family. I remember working on a farm there for a, a living stuff. Maybe in about 11, 12 years old in that area. Uh, I, I had reaped some 
fruits of my father's labor. He had taught me to handle a team at that young age. I mean, I could, I could harness horses. Uh, I remember putting harness on a horse when I was not tall enough to reach to fashion a collar. I'd have to put the collar on the upside down and pull it up around his neck and fashion and pull it around and turn it back over to get the harness on the horse. But I could still harness the horse. And after I got the horse harnessed, then I, I was able to plow. One, one, on one instance, there was an embarrassing time happened to me. Uh, I was plowing, and my plow went under a root, and I didn't have the strength to pull the plow out. So I looked at it, and I cried a while, and I pulled, and I shook, and couldn't get it out. And I went to the house and got my mother to come and help me get the plow out. So I got the plow out, and so I went on whistling and plowing. And then I, <laughs> after I got the plow loose. These are some of the things that, that I confronted with in my early yeah. youth. All right, now what about your schooling? Do you remember, I mean, the schoolhouse that you went to first? Yes, I do. What was the name of it? Uh, Thankful School. And this school, it had a somewhat of a history behind it. The school I went to, it was a two-room school building. But before this, it started in a log building just across the yard from where the two-room school building went that I went to school to. And uh, this school building was a log building. It had one door and one window, as the legend goes, was told to me. And the seats in that school building was, fortunately, they had got to a sawmill and split a log in half mm -hmm. and then took what they call a two-inch auger or whatnot and bored holes in the bottom side, drove pegs in there for legs, and mm -hmm. then that's what the children had to set up. Nothing to lean back against, no place to lay their books, just hold the books. No desk or anything. No desk. That's, that was the beginning of Thankful School. And uh, the first teacher that, that, I, uh, that was related to me that taught there was a, a white man, uh, Mr. Vince McGannis. He taught there in the first part of that school. But uh, for my part, some of the first teachers that I remember was uh, Reverend and Mrs. Charlie Harris, husband and wife, taught school there, and I went to school to them. Then after that, another Reverend Edward Hayes, he taught school there, and his sister, Ms. Ruby Hayes, taught school there. I went to, to all of them. Now, pardon me just a minute. You referred to this first one as a white man. Were these others white people or black people? No, these are black people. Oh, the last okay. of the black okay. people. That's yeah. the only... Uh -huh. uh, white man that I, that I have reckon, uh, have any uh, knowledge of teaching there. Well, back at that time, <coughs> the, the black person never had the privilege to go to school enough to get a teacher's proper certificate, did That's they? true. That's, that's what and they said. And then later on, as you remember coming up, they had had the chance to get the certificate. They had the chance to get the certificate. That's great. I mean, that, that tells me something there right. of moving up a little bit right at that point. Right. And how far did you go in school? To the seventh grade. I completed the sixth grade. I went part of the time, but due to hardships and whatnot, yeah. I was only able to finish the sixth grade. Would you want to go into detail, or would you just soon let that ride on past? Well, I, it, it may help somebody. I, I'd like to talk a little bit about it. Let it go. Um, generally speaking, in the, uh, I went to school till I was in the sixth grade, and then my mother being weekly and not able to work, somebody had to work to support the family. And, and I say at, at age 14, I took a regular job. But before I took a regular job, I uh, I done part-time work. I started out working at three cents an hour. I would get 30 cents for 10 hours work. And I worked a number of 10 hours. It was not just out there, but I worked 10 hours for 30 cents. And I was able to buy quite a bit with that 30 cents, and uh, I would give it to my mother for support of the family. Went on like this for a period of time, and my three sisters were younger than I was. And it come time then for somebody to, after my elder brother married, Somebody had to take the lead of the family support. 
So I told my mother one day, I said, Mother, I'm going to quit school and, and get a job. She said, well, said, said, I hate for you to do that. said, you need the school. Because I tried working, going to school two days and working three, and I couldn't keep up with my grades. I, uh, I tried, but I was able to make passing marks, but they were something I guess you'd call psychologically there that, that I was just not able to cope with because I couldn't keep up. Uh, my classmates knew so much more about the lessons they had the last two days that I was not there. I was always behind, so I gave it up and quit school. So I took this regular job. I took this regular job, and uh, I was making, at that time, I got to the place where I was making uh, uh, 30 cents an hour. I got to where I was making 30 cents an hour. No, pardon me, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. No problem. I was making 10 cents an hour uh -huh. in that regular job. That's right. This one I made 30 cents an hour. That's when I went to the furniture factory. But I was, uh, I worked there and I worked at 5 cents an hour and worked at 10 cents an hour. But after I worked that way for a while, then I, I got a job at a milk dairy. And I worked at this milk dairy and I start work every morning at 4.30, Sunday, Monday, rain or shine, those cows had to be milked. We'd start working at 4.30. We was milking 31 cows by hand. And I had from eight to nine cows that I would personally milk. That was my job. And in this uh, particular job, I did not desert my devotion to church work. I delivered the milk, but on Sunday morning, it would take us duly, during the week, it would take us till 11 o'clock to deliver the milk and get back to wash the balls. But on Sunday morning, we would go and deliver that same amount of milk and was back home and dressed and in Sunday school at 10 o'clock. How we would do it, we would not use the full value of the milk truck to deliver the milk. We would take a crate of milk and one would take one street and one the other. One would drive the truck and leave it and he would go another street and then another one would take a crate of milk and go the way and come back and whichever driver got back first would drive mm -hmm. to the next corner and leave the truck for the next. So we had it so engaged, so organized until we could deliver our milk and get back and be in Sunday school. That way, I and the partner that I worked with, we were able to hold positions in Sunday school, be there on time, and, uh, and the work went on. So this was, was, was some of the things that I confronted in my, my early life. Uh, one more thing that I remember. Uh, my father was a man that said, let your word be your bond. Right. And some of that rubbed off on me, I guess, because if I promise you anything, then I like to do that. So uh, I had promised when I took the job at the dairy that, that I'd be on time. That was essential, that the work go on. So one morning I, I, I overslept to the extent that I just had about 10 minutes to get to the job. I could walk it in about eight minutes, but I just had 10 minutes to get there. I usually went a little early. But that particular morning, it rained hard that night, and I didn't know it. I had a creek to cross. And this particular creek to cross, it was the water was swirling muddy about 10 foot deep. And when it was only about a foot or a foot and a half deep, you could wade if necessary. But I had a foot log that I crossed. But that time, the foot log was all swept away and everything. So I got there. When I went down the hill to the creek, the creek was between me and my jaw. If I had to go back and go around to the bridge, I'd have been about 30 minutes late by running. Yeah. Though I had to go so far around to get to the bridge. So that particular morning, I went down, and I had a flashlight with me. And I looked around, and it looked like there's no way to get across. But I looked up, and there were two trees that had fell together in the top. One was on either bank of the creek. It had fell together and locked in the top. So I took my flashlight. And, and looked up this tree, and I said, now it's possible 
that I can get to the other side by climbing one tree and coming down the other. So I climb up one tree and come down the tree on the other side, and I went on to work, and I was still on time. And the man wanted to know how I got across the creek, so I told him how I got across. And he was just, he was just shocked. He said, you could have fell in that water as deep as it is this morning and drowned. We never know what become of you. I said, well, I made a promise that I'd be here. And said, so I've seen a way out to get here, and so I'm here. And I told, after that, I, uh, I, after I started preaching, I, I preached a sermon, uh, how to get from where I am to where I want to be. And I used this tree as the, uh, as the way to get from where I was to where I wanted to be, which is so true in life. If I'd have never looked up, I'd have never seen how to get there. So in life today, the, the, the way to get from where you're at to where you want to be, remember, it's not down, but look up, and you can get there. But that's one way of getting from, from where you're at to where you want to be. Your father must have been a very spiritual man too, wasn't he? He was. He was a Methodist minister. The reason I'm saying this is to instill into you the values. And your mother must have been a very religious person too, wasn't she? She was. Mother was, was very religious. She was a missionary worker. And after my father died, then she took the initiative of, of teaching us children the same principles that her and my father had stood on down through the years. Honesty was, was one principle that mother and father taught us. If you don't have anything else, be honest. Of course, you get get it on us. When I was talking with you the other day, uh, you told me a little incident, and uh, I asked you if it'd be all right to talk about it again today. About she didn't prefer you to gamble. Right. Would you uh, want to elaborate again on that little story you told me, or have you just seemed to pass on it? Well, I'd be glad to, because I mean, it's a part of my life, yeah. and, and I attribute this to to me being able to live today without gambling. Mother taught us that uh, it was wrong to, to gamble, and she brought it down so simple that any time that you put your money out there,